Hey everyone, how are you doing today? It's Women Seeking Wholeness Wednesday. I'm Cherie Burton. This is episode 180 and we're going to be talking about sexuality. It's never a super comfortable topic for me, but I'm just getting to the point in my life where I'm like, you know what? There's stuff we got to talk about. Do you ever feel like your body's been hijacked? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, You'll hear in this episode from a really brilliant woman, Dr. Heather Bartos, who's a board certified OBGYN and author, podcast host of The Me Spot and Mother. She tells it like it is when it comes to what's happening with women's bodies and sexuality. Lots of massive mixed messaging from churches, society, family systems, social media regarding what it means to have healthy sexuality when in actuality it is a case by case thing, definitely not a one size fits all. So we're going to get into that. The link between self care and sexuality and Dr. Bartos talks about why many messages we've been fed about self care are quote unquote crap. <laughs> Remember to follow us on Instagram, Sheree.Burton. I'm unveiling some cool things with this podcast very soon. If you think that I've been bold before, I'm not going to be mincing words here, (laughs) especially as we move into the fall and all the swift changes that come with that. I think a lot of people are feeling it um, in their bodies, in their spheres of influence and where they inhabit in both their inner and outer worlds. So with that said, let's bring on Dr. Heather Bartos. Dr. Heather Bartos, I'm so glad we finally connected. I know we had a few reschedules and I always just trust divine timing, like it needs to work out when it works out. So just grateful to have you on. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. And we have had, we've kind of like done some back and forth, I think, but we're here. It's perfect. It's perfect now. So I trust it. So tell me why you went into the field of women's health, OBGYN. Why did yeah, that? I, yeah. I actually started off in marketing and public affairs. And then around 28, I said, I don't want to do this forever. I wanted to do something more, I thought. And so I started doing public relations for a hospital system in Houston. And then voila, I applied to medical school and got in. And I was the oldest woman in my class at 28. What? There were older men, like in their 40s, but I was the old lady (laughs) and I had no intention of going to women's health. I really did a lot of children's advocacy and um, minority relations kind of work. And so I really thought I wanted something like that. And then I realized that children are sick all the time and I was sick all the time. And I thought "Mm, this is not going to work. So I like to think of women's health is it kind of, it's the whole like spectrum of a woman's life. So I take care of little ones and like little old Betty white ladies and then I always joke that I'm like the first pediatrician. If you're pregnant, I like take care of the baby before the baby's even out. So it kind of worked out as it was supposed to. And I then kind of thought, you know, I need something that I really am passionate about. And so it became kind of sexual health was really kind of how that kind of started. That's really cool. And you're a mom. I am a mom. In fact, today was the last day of school, but you're going to hear this around the first day of school for next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This will air later, early, early in the fall. But yeah, I know it's, you know, um, I always respect people who go into that field because I think it, 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 it's a level of reverence because you're bringing new life in. It's mm-hmm. just like being a mom, right? But you're, as your profession, you're literally witnessing the arrival of all these souls into the world. And like you said, nurturing them before they're even born. Mm-hmm. I've always just respected that field. And it's, I think it's largely been driven by men. Like you said, you were one of the minor, like one of the older women. Yes. But. It's now become very women driven, like just now. I mean, yeah. I'm probably in the mid generation because I'm a little bit older. Um, so kind of above me is like kind of the, the glass ceiling with all the old men. And then now it's pretty much all women kind of oh. below me in the, in the years below, about 20 years below me. It's all women. And I think because awesome. women like going to a woman because we know what period cramps feel like we know what labor feels like we know what all these things are yeah and while men are great they can be very sympathetic they just haven't been there right right i always had a male OBGYN. the whole all the kids yeah. and uh he after he retired i had the same ob mm-hmm. uh, but after he retired i actually sought out a female 
for that reason, because, you know, I'm changing and hormonal and going into menopause and, and actually I had a nurse practitioner and then she's like, well, you really need to have a doctor on the, on, on tap. (laughs) And so, uh, I did, I, I sought out a female and I, and I'm pleased with that, but I, I mean, I'm not trying to be sexist and I'm not like trying to stereotype or anything, but you're right there. There is this comfortability with having someone who understands the plumbing from a personal internal perspective. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. And you also have a background in the military. You were in the U S Navy, like, like, and, and also you were associate professor, professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Yeah. That's amazing. I know. I sound really old when you say all that. <laughs> you, you look super young. So I'm just like, are you like an Uber overachiever or what's happening right it's now? It's a good filter. I just have a good filter on right now. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's the Botox. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you have a youthfulness about you. It's, it's You have a lot of radiance. But okay, so let's transition into what, what I'm most curious about. And I expressed this to you before we started recording is um, when I... I think sexuality is a trigger word for a lot of people and especially women, I would say, honestly, mostly because, um, you know, the whole me too movement, da, 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 da. Uh, I think I referenced earlier with you that there can be some <sighs> religion, religious based sex shaming unknowingly, sometimes knowingly, it's almost like you, you can't own your own body. So there's two things I'm curious about. The first one is, um, what did you see in your practice with, and was it apparent that women had some kind of body shaming or body inhibition or what, what, what were you experiencing with that as an OB? Yeah, it's really interesting that our beliefs about our sexuality are cemented by age eight. Really? And none of us have any idea what sexuality even could be at age eight, but that's kind of where all of our kind of internal beliefs are cemented. And we get that from our families. So, you know, mom and dad, grandparents, aunts and uncles. We also get that for a lot of people from school and from church. And, you know, so that's a lot of information coming into a young woman, a young girl about her body and what it means. And, you know, this is a, grand time when a lot of young girls are told don't touch that that's dirty you know that's not what you should be you should be pure you should be chaste i mean it's it's kind of prevalent in pretty much all major religions and in all schools i mean you know there's still a dress code for schools for the girls that not oh, yeah. the boys my daughter has and- been sent home for wearing shorts that are too short Yes. I mean, they can't wear, you know, like it's, it's, you know, here in Texas, it's a hundred degrees and they can't wear like a sleeveless shirt. They have to have their shoulders covered. Hmm. You know, we we hear about this and and it's still prevalent. And then, you know, a lot of times families were raised, our parents were raised in the kind of manner that their parents were raised. And so unless someone changes something, we're just kind of passing these generational beliefs down. And yes, a lot of it stems from, you know, especially in this country, puritanical type beliefs, yeah. Purity um, culture, toxic purity culture. Yeah. Which yeah. to me felt like the ideal. I thought purity, well, what's, what's wrong with that? Yeah. You know what I mean? That, that, that was the ideal, the, the virginal maiden, the, the modest sort of conservative. Um, yeah. That, that perpetual image of the ideal feminine mm-hmm. is, is, I didn't, it didn't register for me until I was probably in my forties that that's not healthy. <laughs> like no. At all. no, cause it lacks education. You know, I think that a woman can choose to live her sexuality, how she wants, but I have many couples. I have a young couple that I'm working with right now. Well, they're young. They're 30. That's um, young. That's young to me. Young. Um, raised in a very Southern Baptist type religion where, where, and bless their hearts, they got married and they, they waited until they were married to have sex. And now that they're married, it's been five years. They haven't had sex. It's not, they didn't know. He never was taught how to do anything. And so he really was thinking he was kind of asexual. Like he's like, well, I guess I just am not sexual. And I was like, well, are you, or are you just need some education on how this works? And she went the opposite way. She started having pain issues with sex 
because she was taught that you got, you know, keep your legs crossed and keep everything buttoned up. And so now that she's married, she couldn't, she didn't know how to kind of relax into that new kind of vibe. But again, you know, and they both have left their churches since then, but, you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, 30 years of, of trauma. I mean, really baggage that we have to unpack to get to where they can actually start to have a relationship again. So it's, it's on both sides, women and men, but it's, of course, we see a lot of women doing what we do. That's the good girl syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. That your whole upbringing, like, don't think about it. Don't entertain thoughts about it. Don't touch yourself. Don't touch anyone else. Like all these things guard you. And there's literally a phrase in my religion of origin, Mormonism of like to guard your virtue with your life. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's like better almost to die than to have your virtue violated. Yeah. Um, So those kind of messages just sort of, you know, and then all of a sudden you're, you get married because my husband and I didn't have sex after we got married, but like, it's like all of a sudden, Oh, now anything goes or what? Like, how do I feel about this? Like, I like over, not like not even overnight in an hour after you're married, you're like, Oh, my whole world, my whole sexuality is now just supposed to magically blossom and be healthy. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. And it, you have a new identity all of a sudden because you haven't been transitioning to a different identity. And I certainly think that that's, you know, a wonderful thing to wait yeah. for sex, you know, until your marriage. Yeah or, you know, be intimate until you're married. But I don't think there's a good transition for most people on that. Okay. Now what? Cause we were taught this, like you said, Madonna versus whore syndrome. You're one or the other. Yeah. You're either very pure or you're a whore. Like that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Those are the two yeah. options. And you, you know, you can't be anything in between that. I remember my roommate in college had a book. She was raised in the cow face and she had a book called good girls do and it was what you could do that was church sanctioned that wasn't doing it oh interesting and i was always like what's that book about because i wasn't raised in that faith and i was like what's in that book and she kind of was real real kind of she kind of hid it from me (laughs) but i should have stolen it i guess and read it but um but yeah it's interesting how you know and and i'm pretty sure the men don't have a book called good boys do well, no. whatever it is. I mean, yeah. we kind of, you know, celebrate that in men, but it's amazing how many places just don't teach healthy sexuality. And I found out just the other day that only 17 states require sex education that is accurate and up to date. That's it. A whole country, 17 states. Um, okay. There's that's a lot of that's disturbing. Are. Well, yeah. I mean, I think it is a collective wound and a collective, um, confusion it's um you know i was just listening to a podcast about asexuality so i got a whole new education on that and you know of course we have the whole spectrum right lgbtq plus ia you know and there's more and i and i'm like this is so interesting that people are now giving voice and sort of normalizing some seemingly dysfunctional as opposed to what normal is and it's it's healthy and i also feel like you know um i just i don't know i just have a lot of respect for this all getting out in the open now and for people talking okay. about it it doesn't matter how we feel about it or how we what it, what standards we put on it it's a reality for people it's part of their identity and all of this um and that's why there isn't a one size fits all in terms of healthy sexuality for each, for everyone. It's very individual. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have to find your, what, what speaks to you. And I always call it your inner sexy. That's like, it's just what your kind of vibe and your joy is. And, and we may have completely different ones. You know, someone may have be like, well, you know, I really feel like you know, uh, 50 shades of gray type stuff is my thing. And someone would be like, you know, that's just not my thing. I really am about this. And it's respecting each other's sexuality and what makes each woman sexy in her own way. So, you know, it's not, that it's not all, they're not all looking like Bella, you know, Hadid and Gigi Hadid. They're not looking like that. It's, it's celebrating the sexuality that each woman brings to the table, which is really what the kind of divine feminine really is, which is, you know, looking at us. I mean, and one time, a long time ago, women were really respected for sexuality. And that was actually our thing. And then, then, you know, of course, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but the patriarchy started and was, you know, even back in the days of Kings, you know, poor Princess Diana had to be proven a virgin before she could marry 
Prince Charles. Who we did not know that. Yes, oh, she had to go through the, the test. And they were like, this is so archaic. You know, I mean, but he didn't have to go through that test. Oh, no, no. no. Yeah, no, he didn't have to go through that. No, we would never that's, make a man do that. That's insane to me. I just, the double standards. Uh, I do, I do think that is shifting, like you said, even with the shift in the uh, percentage of female OBGYNs that are, you know, now leading the field. It feels like, you know, coming back to the patriarchy because I just cannot help myself. <laughs> so, and we know patriarchy is not men. It's, it's an ideology. It's, yes. it's a construct. It's, it's institutions, it's systems, it's ideologies, all that stuff. So with respect to owning your own sexuality, because I, that's another thing that I was programmed with that, that my my body that someday when I got married that, and, and I don't think, I don't know that this was explicitly stated, but it was understood that I would have to give myself over. Mm-hmm. And that meant a little bit of a reduction in power. I have a great husband. He could not be more supportive and loving and all that and sensitive, but I, I have come across many women who willingly submit sexually, even though their body's saying no, or this is uncomfortable or, or I'm, you know, I'm not emotionally prepared right now that that's their duty. So have you ever, have you ever come across that? Oh yes. We see that a lot. And I think you're right. It's not explicitly said it's almost an undercurrent in our DNA at this point, because it's just been so perpetuated throughout time. I remember my mother telling me about how she was, you know, a virgin when she got married and all this. And it was just like, it, and I remember asking her, cause I like to test my mother a lot when I was younger. Um, that's probably not surprising. Um, and I remember saying, what would, what would you do if I got, you know, what would you do if I got, uh, if I, you know, went to jail, she's like, well, we would still love you. Of course. You know, I totally went through kind of things and, with my mom too. And then, and then I was like, you know, what would you do if I stole something? You know, I, mean, I would kind of test her with these questions. And I said, what would you do if I got pregnant? And she go, well, we'd be very, very disappointed in you. But of course we would still love you. I was like, whoa, that's like a totally different shift. I mean, I could have like murdered somebody and she was like, we would love you. But I was like, if I got pregnant outside of marriage, it was like, the first thing yeah. was to be disappointed. And the disappointment is that, is that undercurrent of shame. And so you're like, Oh, so if I got pregnant, that's worse than killing somebody in her mind. Oh, well, let me tell you in my religion of origin, that was perpetuated in my day. That sexual sin before marriage is next to murder or outside of marriage at all. Yeah. Um, Yes. Interesting. It is. And it was just never said, but I just automatically knew right then and there that that was you know, I'd already, I got a new belief right then and there that, that this was, this is bad, you know, and that's, and I hate the word good and bad. Cause it's just so like, you said, it's a spectrum. All of this is a spectrum. And so by saying something's good or bad, we're automatically shaming somebody or we're setting it up for shame and blame and guilt and all those, the three, I call them the three sisters. They're horrible. Guilt, shame, and regret are the three worst sisters. Uh-huh. And and then that's how, that's literally how civilizations kept people in line for, for, you know, back when like there was, you know, fire and you threw your baby in the fire and then they then the maybe die and they go, Oh, you're bad. And that's how they would make sure that you didn't do something again. So they mm-hmm. used it on us. I mean, everybody for eons. And yeah. so now here we are and we're trying to break out of it, but it's still there. It's still like kind of just set in there. And that's why it's, I believe that's kind of why it's gone underground with like the pornography industry and all this deviation and sex trafficking. It's, it's driven it underground yeah. uh, into secrecy and um, covert behavior. Mm-hmm. It's heinous. Uh, I believe that it can have an evil component, but like you, what is good and bad? You know, we each need to get that revelation for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um and, and it's, and it's, and it's so sacred. I, I believe one sexuality is sacred. A shift that I had when I really started studying the divine feminine, cause you brought up the divine feminine mm-hmm. is that our sexuality is for us. It's not co-opted for an institution or a partner. It's for us. 
And that was a whole completely different paradigm shift for me. I'm like, wait, what? That yeah. makes total sense. But is that okay? But I don't know. Maybe I should ask the patriarchy because I don't know. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, like that's where it got sourced. Why would I need to go to the patriarchy and say, is that true? Is that okay? Because traditionally that's how it has been perpetuated is that, that this, um, this leadership hierarchy or what have you has some say over what happens with my own body. Mm -hmm. And once I woke up to that, I'm like, Oh boy. Wow. And if you ask that question to them, they're going to then shame you to further modify your behavior. And it's so subtle and it's so good. They're so good at it that, that you don't even know that it's happening. And then it goes on for another few years until you have another little moment. And then, you know, until you really break out of that whole hierarchy and just know it's about you, then, you know, you're going to be kind of in this cycle and that's how they kind of keep you down. That's right. And it is the shame is a powerful force. It's, it it's even keep people sucks. in line. It really works, but it's, it, yeah, you have to unpack the trauma of it later. So uh, you talked about your having your own inner sexy, but you also share something called the me spot. So I want to understand a little bit more about that. Really intriguing. Yeah, I, <laughs> so um, the me spot is my podcast. I mean, it's, I always call it, it's like a podcast blog and I used it to start educating patients, you know, that I couldn't spend a lot of time with in the office. I'm like, here, listen to this episode on shame or regret or squirting or whatever it was, all the issues that people brought up. And so then it became its own podcast. And I joke that, you know, the G spot, which is this kind of mystical unicorn of a place yeah. that's supposed to hold all this magic was founded by a male doctor doctor named Dr. Grafenberg and it's never been really reproduced but everyone talks about the G spot and I'm like it's not about finding us it's the me spot it's about finding your own area you know there's all these different areas we're like told okay now you're supposed to have epic sex all the time and even if you work full time you have kids and you have all this and then on top of that now there's a new you know now I just spread there's a new A spot and a U spot and, and we just leave women on the scavenger hunt Yes, I don't like one another can't keep up spot. And I was like, we leave one of the scavenger hunt just to prevent just like normal kind of function. And so I always say, we're not going to follow any G spot by some guy who didn't know how he has a vagina. We're going to talk about the me spot. It's all about us. And so that's kind of how that started. So interesting. And you also talk about self care is BS. You can swear if you want to. I do. I (laughs) self-care bullshit. I do. I'm going to, I'm, I'm modifying my language today for, for everybody. Um, I just swore. I said the word bullshit. I, know. I, um, I do. I think that the message that we've been told about self-care is crap. I think that, you know, we look on Facebook and we look on Instagram and we look at kind of what everyone else is doing and we're like, Oh, okay. So to be, to take care of myself, I have to now go to CrossFit three days a week and I have yeah. to, you know, eat this macrobiotic kind of whatever diet and I have to. And so what we end up doing, doing though is we're like okay well self-care then is is wine and crap tv you know and then so we'll go for these extremes but really yeah. self-care is in the middle and what i tell women is is that like i used to suck at taking care of plants i had like a brown thumb people good plants were not good <laughs> and because i treated them all the same i never read that they come with that little plastic tag that had their care instructions and i never bothered reading it i threw them out so I treated all my plants the same. They got the same amount of water, the same amount of light. I never did anything different. And guess what? They died. And it's because every plant has its own set of instructions, how much sunlight it needs, how much water it needs, how often it should be pruned or fertilized. And that's what we are as women. If I follow what works for you self-care wise, I'm just following your self-care instructions and I can wither. You know, if I follow what I think is right for me, which takes, you know, some knowing yourself, you know, I know that I need, you know, this amount of rest a day or this amount of whatever, or I do need some crap TV. I need to watch Bridgerton every, you know, when it comes out and that's it, whatever it is, I have to do what the self care. I call it self love. That's really right for my, for my plants and not your plant. Mm-hmm. And if we start looking at our own self-care and not what everyone else is doing, because again, the wine, the bubble bath, that's escapism. That's not, 
really I truly like really experience. nourishing you at the soul yeah. level. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I had somebody, I love what you're saying. I, I do love everything about like the middle path, you know, staying yes. in the middle way um, where you're avoiding these, these real extreme polarities. But I, I love, um, I had a teacher once from India. Well, he's still my teacher with the Ashanti and uh, he used to be a monk. And he taught me that if you make a joy list, like you just take everything off the table, what you see on social media, everything that everybody else is doing, did it to that. And what people tell you you should want or not want, and, and literally just unfiltered, just write down a whole list of things that light you up that you personally love. Even if your partner doesn't like them, I mean, your kids or whoever, or society is telling you not to like it. Um, or you could even go back to religion. And we're not talking about like devious behavior. We're just talking about lighting up your soul. And I, and I did that. And I, and I refer to that often since I made that joy list. It's like when I, I am more projective, I am better in my relationships, meaning more patient, more present when I'm doing those things, when I, when I schedule those things in, or I advocate and set a boundary for like, this is my time to do these things. When I don't do those things, like when I conform and do what everyone else is doing or like, you know, women, uh, I don't know. I I'm a weird woman. (laughs) I don't like, I don't love like, I never liked mother's groups and sitting around and just kind of like talking about different people or what I just, I always just loved the, the depth tribes that have depth. Um, so I, I did, I just let go of everything that I was told a good woman should do and want and feel. And then I just wrote it. Um, and that's why you're seeing all the weirdness behind me, like my my oracle cards and all the books that I love and my Tibetan sound bowls and my Himalayan salt lamp and all the things, the roses. It's because I finally allowed myself this this pleasure of what lights me up. And when I'm talking about intimacy, I'm sure you've heard that play on the word intimacy into me, I see. Uh, if I'm going to be in an intimate relationship with my husband, I make sure that I'm filled up, that I have given myself those markers in my day to be able to come back to who I am. Otherwise, it feels like I'm being taken. That's the best word I have, or robbed even. Yeah. I know that's, that's strong exactly. language, but like, that's how I feel. We, we always say fill your own cup first. And I always use the example. I think it was Dr. Andrew Weil that talked about the heart, you know, the heart and women are the heart of the home. We're really the heart of the earth, but um, the heart actually takes the freshest blood from the lungs right away. It doesn't take the leftovers. It doesn't mm-hmm. take, you know, a, it takes it right away because it has to, to keep everything else working strongly. So the heart isn't selfish. The heart can't be selfish. It's a heart. Mm-hmm. And so we think of ourselves as that. If we take the freshest part for ourselves, it's not because we're being selfish. It's because we got to take care of a lot of other things and people generally. And so by filling us up first, we're actually being able to do more work out there for others. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like the oxygen mask first on you kind of thing. Exactly. So I want to also ask you about, you talk about remove the princess filter from your life. <laughs> that is so funny and disturbing and cute and interesting. So tell me about what that's about. Yeah, you know, it's interesting um, how advertising and how, and you know, I'm a huge Disney fan, so don't get me wrong. I mean, I love a good princess story as next, as not as much as the next gal, but I didn't really use them a lot with my kids. And the reason is, is it, I think it teaches a false narrative of what we're looking for. You know, I, I really, really did maybe too much to my naivety. I really thought there was some guy that was going to come rescue me. And I certainly loved playing victim for a while when I was in my early twenties. And I was like, well, this guy's going to come, you know, rescue me. That's what they all do. And that wasn't the case, you know, like in pretty woman, she's like, I just need to rescue my, my damn self. And we're kind of showing all these little girls. It's getting better because Disney's kind of coming out with, and I used to use Disney, but there's other ones too, you know, with more kind of 
kind of um, gritty heroines, you know, Moana and Encanto and these kind of everyday gals, but these girls, and I was one of them. I loved wearing the little snow white outfit and I would fall asleep and I would play that and I would wait to get kissed and wake up. And it really (laughs) jacked up my relationships and miss me. I was not me in my relationships because I had this princess filter on where I thought, well, this is, you know, this is what I need to do because this is what, this is the ideal. This is what I'm supposed to want. And, and, you know, there's times I still have to talk myself out of it a little bit. Cause I still think about, you know, well, why can't my husband just come in and just take over and know what I, it, and I have to go, it doesn't work. It doesn't yeah. work. This needs to so a really real learned. disservice to us in that era. Like we just, it, it, did. Oh. it did. I mean, even Barbie is now getting better. I remember I loved Barbies and she was just, you oh. know, and every Barbie thing you played with was, well, you know, Ken's the, Ken's the guy and Barbie just plays, you know, oh, 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 oh. yeah. Can and I, I totally remember playing Barbies with my friend, Susan, where we yeah. would literally pretend one of us got hurt or even raped or something horrible yes. so yes. that the Ken doll could come and be like, Oh, are you okay? Let me take you away. And it's just like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and no one, and we all did it. I mean, like I, we used to pretend drown in our pool so that, and one of us would play a guy and we would come <laughs> the girl. and I was like, this is so, yeah. but, but we do that. And it's, it's play. So we think that it's cute for girls and we think that it's, you know, it's, Oh, that's not bad. I mean, you know, but, but all they did was sing, sing to animals. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, but, and they, and they were they so did, sweet and their voices were, were so high. I and, know. and they got pushed over by everybody. Right. The bad. Yeah, yeah, think of the names too. Snow white, definitely yeah. purity, um, sleeping beauty. Like she's just mm-hmm. so docile. And sleeping. Anyway, but yeah. I wanted to speak to this whole um, masculine and feminine interplay because one of the biggest realizations I had when I kind of went through my feminine awakening was that we are the ones who, who we are waiting for. That the masculine, we are a prince inside of us. We have that capacity, you know, to go back to that archetype. Yeah. We are the ones who rescue us. And we here we are, have been waiting for it to come outside of us. That's not to say that there won't be people to support us and help us or whatever, but even you know, my husband, as much as he loves me and has me on a pedestal and all that, he's going to keep letting me down because I have a certain, I have a certain standard for myself that I see as creating that support and that strength and that masculine power. And when I realized that I can marry those forces within me, I'm both the prince and the princess. I'm both the king and the queen to some in some regards, right. That, oh. that it was that integration of the masculine and feminine. That's actually the last step on the hero's journey, the Carl Jung hero's journey. Um, uh, sorry, Joseph Campbell, not Carl Jung, but how his last step on that hero's journey is just really anchoring in and integrating those, those forces within us. That was a huge life change for me. Life changer for me is to just be like, Oh, Okay. Cause I was what always, it was always outsourcing, always putting it out here and not mm-hmm. really owning that. I have that power within myself. It was very easy. It, we were led very easily to a, like, almost a victim stance. And for women that didn't, couldn't, however it was, couldn't get out of it early enough. There's still, and I don't use victim in a bad way or, you know, like a negative way, but they're still victimizing themselves to, because that's the role they were led to believe was the right role. And I see that in healthcare, you know, women will be like, they'll come with random vague complaints. And really what it is, is they're unhappy with something else. And and so if I, if I say, well, let's stop playing the victim and let's do this. And some women get really offended by that. Even if yeah. they say it really nicely, they're like, I'm not a victim, I, I, but I need a doctor that's going to rescue me. And I'm like, that's the same thing. It's the same thing yeah. as the planet, same yeah. thing as everything. Like, no one's going to come. At the end of the day, I would say we're kind of born by ourselves and we kind of die by ourselves. I know there can be people around, but that's it. It's your journey. And so we really have to just, anchor, like you said, anchor into yourself and know that you're the one that can rescue your damn self. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up because uh, I wondered about that reliance upon a doctor to just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to take. Just, you know, and it, it just precludes you from really just getting that proactivity inside of yourself to, and then, but I do think more patients are self-educating 
too. So you kind of probably see both of those ends of the spectrum. We see both. And I, I do see, I mean, the, the doctor medicine is, has been a form of the patriarchy for, you know, for a long time. And if you watched Outlander, I remember I the Outlander where I, you were where totally I saw, caught up on all seasons. <laughs> yes. Where, the one where she has the baby and they didn't even talk to her. They talked to her husband only. And, we're, and you know, she was a doctor and, and they just ignored her. And I'm like, the medicine has been a form of the patriarchy for a long time. And so I, I think people still think, you know, oh, well, just, just fix it. There's a magic pill. I'm like, there's no magic pill. I wish there was a, if there was a magic pill, I, we would be doing this and I'd be in Fiji right now, like on an Island I owned and I would, not right. be, I would not be, you know, delivering babies all night. There's no magic pill. And that upsets some people to the point where they're like, well, then she's just not giving it to me. I have to go find the magic pill elsewhere. And I'm like, there's just no magic pill. I swear to you, I'm not hiding the magic pill. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, medicine has been partly to blame and we've created victims and women, especially. So yeah, I, I kind of really talk about patient agency, you know, really taking kind of control of your own health care. And certainly, you know, we're consultants, you know, just like anything, you know, if you want to redo your house, you hire a consultant, they're not going to do it for you. We're going to consult. Mm-hmm. And that's a big shift for a lot of people. They don't like that. They like the kind of just, well, just tell me how to fix it. Yeah. It's almost like a parent child dynamic, which is patriarchal. Mm -hmm. That's how we were entrained is to be in a parent child dynamic with power over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So we're going to take that princess filter off. <laughs> find the inner sexy. I do like wearing a good tiara though. So if we want to oh, wear yes, a tiara, no, I'm, time, I'm sure. game. But it'll yeah. be our, our queen tiaras, not our princess tiaras. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we're going to say self-care is a middle path because, you know, it's for us. It's, it's how we do, it's how we oxygenate ourselves and give that fresh blood. I love what you said about the heart. So is there anything else you would add? Like, let's just say, I know, cause you do, you do talk about this too. Like if there's a woman who is in a painfully sexual marriage where it's like, there's it's sexless or it's just off the table or it's just whatever, it's just gotten really dysfunctional. How, how would you have her address that? Yeah, that's, that's a good one because that was kind of my story. Like that's really how I got started in really sexuality because I was personally in a sexless marriage and it was not of my choosing. It was of my husband's choosing. And it's amazing when, when a marriage or a relationship goes sexless, how many stories we start telling ourselves about what's going on. And so, you know, the stories that I was telling myself, cause I had just had another kid, I was over 40 and I thought that's it. I'm fat. That was the first thing I went to. I'm fat or I'm ugly now. Right. I'm over the those hill. Are the, so like so the too thing. feminine. Those are the female. The first, like- yeah. The first woman thing you can go to. And then it was, he must be cheating on me. Um, another good one. That's for good one for me. And then I was like, maybe he's gay. <laughs> I was like, maybe maybe he's gay. And it was none of those things, but in, in a wounded state, I really, I shamed him. Like I sex shamed him and he didn't have good communication skills. He had actually been molested as a child, but never had talked to me about that. And so it was really his own issue, but I made it about me and I made it about much more than if we just had an honest conversation about it. So I had uh, enough to say that this was completely all my thing, but I certainly, I had to kind of go back and do some work. And the work that I did was I, I fixed, I fixed myself and there's a great book. I loved it. It was, um, I read all these books. Oh my gosh. I read every single book out there, you know, the sex starved wife and the, you know, all the, um, the, the sex books out there. And the one that did the most for me was a book called it takes one to tango. Hmm. And it's by a marriage counselor and her whole premise was, is her, she was a marriage counselor and her husband, I believe was a marriage counselor and their marriage was crap. It was crap. Oh my goodness. Going downhill. And so she, um, she said, well, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to work on myself. So all she did was she fixed herself. She fixed her own thoughts. She changed the way she thought about herself. And this is why I kind of took this further with sexuality. And I said, if I'm going to be in a marriage, so I'm not getting divorced. I was like, I'm, I got two kids. I'm not getting divorced. I said, so I got to figure out how to make myself happy. So I just focused on me. Mm-hmm. And not me like in a selfish way, me like, what is it that I want? 
what do I need? And this is when I started doing my kind of my self care instructions, you know, and it's not about what he is. I'll just show up to the party myself. And, you know, I, my, my biggest examples I always say is that, you know, I would come out the closet and I'd be wearing some outfit and I'd be like, how do I look? And my husband is a talker, but he's not an effusive romantic man. And so he'd be like, okay, good. And it would just, I would, it would tear me up. And I was like, why can't you see I look amazing? Well, on our wedding day at the altar, he, had, he goes, you look nice. <laughs> so why was I expecting that now I was going to get, like, you look hot. Let's go to the bedroom right now. So I had expectations that I had created that were, that were not, that were not right. And so I just didn't even need it anymore. I just walked out and I was like, I look good. This looks good. And I stopped asking. And then, you know, the compliments started coming That's on their so own. so powerful. I just want to pause for a second there. Wait, that is massive. That takes a lot of self-awareness, self-discipline, self-love. So I just want to applaud that because oh, that is, it was, that it was, was a really, very rough time in my life, <laughs> but, but you, but you took that time and that is self-care. Would you not agree? That is, that is that's the highest really the self-care. form of self-care. Yeah. That really is, is what is this is self-care at its like core. And, and so I realized I don't need him to say I look amazing. I just had to look at my, and in the beginning, I'm not going to lie. I was faking it. I was like, you look really good out there. Oh my gosh. You look amazing. And I would just kind of, kind of then go with it. And I stopped asking. And you know what happens when you stop asking is people start saying something. If I'm not chasing them around the room, waiting yeah. for something good, they come to you. It's just the whole dynamics. And so by that point I was like, well, I'm on with something here. Like this is working for us. And so eventually by not pushing and I'm not chasing by looking at myself only, he came back to the relationship and it's better than ever. But it took, and I had, you know, I did have to do some apologizing for shaming because I'm, you know, my anti-shame and here I did, I shamed him. This was about 10 years ago. And so, yeah, so it was, it was rough, but the sexless marriage and, sex, and we all do it. We all go through a sexless relationship at some point, whether it's from children or whatever. So really the goal is, is, is don't, don't overanalyze why it's happening. Just say, Hmm, this is interesting why is this happening? Mm-hmm. And say, is it something, is he unhealthy or is she unhealthy or what's, what's going on? Like, what is it? Or are they going through their own thing? Have they been laid off? I mean, there's so many reasons why we don't want right. to have sex at any one time. Mm-hmm. But I think we're just, again, the princess filter is, well, I, it must be me. I must be horrible. I must look ugly. So it really is. You got to look inside. Yeah. It kind of goes back to that whole like 1950s housewife type of, you know, just like, well, it must be me. What am I doing wrong? And if I just make him more comfortable, but what you're saying is so much more empowering. It makes the man circle back more, which is like, I'm going to claim happiness for myself. I'm going to seek that validation inside of me. I'm not going to be reliant on, on his opinion. And even though it would be a nice bonus that takes, that does take quite a bit of self-discipline. So I just want to honor that. And, um, for you could literally roll that into everything, not just intimacy and sexuality, but like everything, like your peers, your family, you know, it's, it's just, it all comes back to like, we don't need other people to give us the thumbs up. It would be great. (laughs) But what it does is it triggers a primal fear of isolation Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and that is probably people's biggest fear is they're going to be alone and rejected and and uh, we need that that uh, we need our tribes we need our people so yeah so finding that within is is where it's at and I think it's different for everyone but it, what, that's what I hear you saying is that if you if you want if you're in a sexless joyless whatever relationship. And, and you're waiting for that person to all of a sudden find you wildly attractive. You've got to find yourself wildly attractive first. And through that confidence and that, that uh, surety that you hold for yourself, it's an attraction factor for that other partner. Well, exactly. And that confidence and that assurity is the basis of sexy. That's what sexy is. Mm-hmm. When we look at women that we think, oh, wow, she's so sexy. And I always think of Sophia Loren, who, when you look at her, is kind of just different looking. She's not classically beautiful, but men found her wildly sexy. Why? Because she had that that I call the juge, right? She was, she was confident. She was self-assured. She wasn't like, oh my gosh, are you going to call me later? She was like, 
I am I can, Sophia Loren. <laughs> Screw you, I am Sophia Loren. I can do whatever I, I am want. a goddess. Yeah, she <laughs> kind of personifies that like goddess of, you know, knowing and embodied feminine flowing, very strong. Um, it doesn't help that she was also very beautiful. Like you said, there are probably by whoever standards, more beautiful actresses, but it's what she embodied with her confidence. And actually, um, I, I minored in sociology in college. And, um, I remember reading the study that was talking about, and it was a large sociological study, thousands and thousands of respondents, but they, they polled men and asked them young men, what they found most, and this is like men 18 and 25 or something like that, what they found most attractive in females in a female and far and away, it was confidence. Yeah. It's like when she cuts herself down, that's totally unattractive when, you know, we've been programmed to think that this dependent maiden that we were talking about before, like the damsel in distress is more attractive to men that, um, it may, it might make them feel a little bit more masculine that they can go and rescue that, but that's not what they want long-term. What they're really looking for is a woman who knows who she is and can like the Sophia Loren, who just kind of embodies like, I am Sophia, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and that's, and I thought that was so interesting. That just stayed with me. I don't know how many years I graduated, like 26 years ago, but it's always stayed with me that that is the attraction factor is the confidence. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of men will talk about, we did a bunch of surveying of men too. And, and a few years ago in a recent study, um, and, and over and above, it was, it was, we were asking about physical attributes. Um, and the biggest things were eyes, which I believe are just what's behind the eyes and yeah. smell. Um, never, and there, smile. Were, there were a few, yeah, there were a yeah. few angles that, you know, wanted to answer like her butt or, and I was like, okay, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and those are the men you get if you play dance on the stress too long, but it was really, it was, it, and you could tell eyes and smile is what's behind the eyes and the smile. I yeah. mean, I can, do a fake smile and it's going to be unattractive or I can just have a natural smile with, you know, lit up eyes. And that's, that's that confidence. That's so awesome. Yeah. You can only stay at a butt for so long before you don't have a relationship with a butt, but you can look <laughs> in someone's eyes and see their smile and connect there. Right. It's the window to the soul. Oh my gosh. So awesome. So where can people find your offerings online? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram mostly these days. I'm kind of, I don't know, I'm kind of off the Facebook train, but I'm still there too. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Heather Bartos. And then I still have the Me Spot podcast. It's over on Apple and Spotify and all your favorite podcasting apps. And it's about 15 minutes. It's not suitable for work or for kids. I will say that. Okay, good to know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's um, you know, I think I think they marked it explicit because I talk about vaginas and other things. So which why is um, that even explicit? I know I can't even I can't even write the word sex on Instagram without getting shadow banned sometimes. Really? But um, yes, yeah, so, you know, like the patriarchy. Remember? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're probably in charge of Instagram and Facebook. Oh. Someday. So yeah. So if you go over to Instagram, I'm usually hanging out over there. Sweet. Well, I'll definitely put that into the show notes and it's just been a joy to talk to you. Um, it's kind of uh, sparked some more, some deeper inquiry within me around um, claiming my own style of feminine essence and sexuality. And it's something that I, I really wasn't even aware of it literally until I was almost 50 years old. I'm 53 now. Yeah. Like I just didn't even, I, it, I mean, I've always felt like a sexual person and sensual and everything, but I just, I wouldn't let myself be a sexual being in, in like, and say that I am, if that makes sense, because good girls yeah. and good women don't do that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I'm irresponsible. I mean, I'm very monogamous and all that, but it's, it's just like, Hey, why, why, why can't we talk about that? So I love that you have a whole podcast on it for crying out loud, the me spot. So yes, we will have uh, links to that. And uh, it's just been awesome talking to you today. It's been a pleasure. I loved it. I'm glad we finally got together. I know. I know. So I think we've established that one sexuality is private. It's sacred. It's ours to claim. That's what the whole sovereignty message is about, is about having unmediated access to your own body, to your own soul, and to your own relationship with creator, which is heavily linked into the sacredness of your own body. At least that's the goal, is to bring them back into conscious union. 
your soul and your body. And if we're always fighting our sexuality and our human God-given desires and birthright to feel those things, then we're always going to feel separate, which is never a good thing. It's like crazy making for us to feel that separateness. So if you want to dive deeper into Dr. Heather Bartos's work, you can go to her website, heatherbartosmd.com. She has a podcast called The Me Spot. I did also want to mention here as well that my Mend Your Marriage course would be a great fit for those of you trying to heal that within your conscious relationships as a partnership um, in monogamous relationship. And that is mendyourmarriage.org. The whole course is less than the price of a marriage counseling session. All the highlights that I learned from consciously healing my own marriage of now 27 years um, after almost divorcing after nearly 25 years of marriage. So, so lots of good resources for you out there if you really want to heal your sexuality and you want to feel like you have ownership of your body. And remember to follow us on Shree.Burton Instagram, as well as ask to join our private Facebook group, Women Seeking Wholeness. Have a glorious week, and we'll talk to you next time on Women Seeking Wholeness.